Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. I'm Ben Stone, Director of Arts and Culture with Smart Growth America. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully, everyone can hear me and see the images on the screen. If not, feel free to let us know in the chat. Um, we have a Q&A function. We have a chat. Um, you will be able to let us know what you're thinking, ask us questions, encourage you to put any questions you have for myself and for our other two panelists into the Q&A function. You're also welcome to use the chat to speak to one another as well. So we are just at the point where we're wrapping up the second year of the Minnesota Department of Transportation Artists and Residents program. We're gonna hear from Jessica O oh with MnDOT about how that program has been going, as well as Marcus Young, the artist who's been serving that role for the last two years. Um, as I begin, I, as you see on the screen here, would like to thank some of our funders for this work, um, most importantly, MnDOT itself has been funding this program since the beginning. Um, Art Place America provided some seed funding to get this program started a couple of years ago, as well as the McKnight Foundation, and more recently, the National Endowment for the Arts. Next. So we at Smart Growth America, we're a national nonprofit based in Washington, DC. I myself am out in the Bay Area. We have had an arts and culture team for five and a half, almost six years now. And as you see on the screen here, we fund projects um, to create exemplary case studies, which is exactly what we've done with MnDOT and other DOTs. We track the work that's happening at the intersection of art and culture to help communicate its benefit, try to change policy to make this work more easy to actually produce. And then we often in the past would bring people together, as you see on the screen there in large rooms, convention centers and whatnot to train people from the arts side of things to work with transportation planners and engineers and train transportation professionals to work with artists, which we now do mostly in a virtual style. Next. Um, many of you are probably familiar with some of our work we've completed with Art Place, uh, as shown on the screen here, we released a field scan on the intersection of arts, culture and transportation back almost four years ago at this point. Next. And much of that work really looked at how artists benefit transportation projects. There's seven different um, areas shown on the screen here as to how artists actually help people in the transportation world. Um, the very short origin story for the Artists in Residence program you're going to hear about today, as well as the parallel program at Washington State DOT started by my conversations with Art Place, looking into all the different ways that artists work on these kinds of projects and recognizing that a lot of great work happens at the municipal level, the local level, but there wasn't as much involvement for some good reasons at the state level. Uh, whereas many of us know that state DOTs control a lot of the decisions that are made, have a huge impact, especially in rural areas where state roads often serve as main streets on the quality of life for people in those communities. So we set about to actually change that by building on a precedent that exists in a number of places and creating an artist in residence program. Next. Um, before I jump into more details on that program, I did wanna mention, as some of you hopefully know, that we recently launched a new website called the scenic route, transportation.art is the URL, able to snag that one so it's easy to remember. If you visit the site, you'll see this as your home screen. Everything we're talking about today can be found here in much more detail as, when, as well as all of our other projects at this intersection. Next. So talking about arts and residence programs and giving the whole origin story of how these programs existed could be its own hour long presentation. So I will not be going into a huge amount of detail, but I do wanna mention that there are a number of these programs now I'm constantly adding to this list. Um, if any of you on the call or on this uh, meeting now know of other programs in your own communities or other communities, I'd encourage you to put that in the chat. I'll make sure to add it to the list. Um, at last count, these are all the different cities uh, that have these programs as well as a couple states now. Um, there weren't any states at all in the United States that had state level artists and residents until Minnesota and Washington created their programs with our support. Next. And you can't really talk about the, the origin story of artists and residents without talking about Merle later than you Kelly's, who back in the late 70s started as an artist in residence with New York City, still going strong now in a part time fashion. Um, did a number of projects, still is doing a number of projects. Perhaps her most famous project is the Touch Sanitation performance, which she did in the early days. Um, and you'll hear a little bit about a similar program that I'll touch on in just a moment at Washington State. Um, and Merle really focused on the fact that uh, the, the sanitation workers who are responsible, as she put it, for keeping New York City alive, were not really that respected, were not paid as well as they would like to have been paid. And 
she set about to actually uh, be photographed shaking the hands and telling the staff in all these different places um, that their work was appreciated and try to bring a sense of humanity to the work that they were doing. Next. Um, fast forward a little bit, the, uh, I believe the first more contemporary version of an artist in residence within a DOT uh, took place in Los Angeles. Alan Nakagawa served in that role back in 2017, um, won the, uh, I think the best headline definitely in 2017, probably in the last few years, why you should stick your hand in this mystery box at the bus stop, normally not the best move, but in this case, totes fine. Um, that is, yes, an actual headline. Um, and did a number of projects as well involving teaching um, civil engineers how to do better, a better job of storytelling for public meetings. And also did this project which involved uh, playing with the olfactory connection to memory to give people a good smelling experience while waiting for the bus. So they would associate their memory of waiting for the bus and riding the bus as a positive experience. Next. Um, I know uh, Mary, I believe is on this this meeting. So uh, Mary, I know you're here as an audience member, but feel free to chime in in the chat if you have any questions or corrections to anything I'm about to say. Um, so Washington State, as I mentioned, had a similar program to what you're about to hear about at MnDOT um, that ran for a year concurrently with the first year of MnDOT's program. I have some exciting news to share about that program in the near future that I can't share quite yet. So that's just a teaser. Um, but Mary Welcome and Kelly Gregory, shown here on the screen, standing in the middle of a road that I promise is closed. Um, served in that role as the first artist in residence at the state DOT in Washington. Next. And really quickly, and this again could be its own presentation, some of the work they completed in their first year, which was cut just short because of the pandemic beginning right at the end of that year, was creating a space where um, the intention of this, this space, the studio space, this room shown on the screen here with lots of images from the work that WashDOT does, was really an intentional, intentionally creative space for staff to come in, get away from their normal cubicles and offices and have creative conversations with their colleagues and the artists in residence. Next. They took a lot of the quotes they heard from their many, many conversations around Washington State and turned it into a card deck. Um, this is available as well as the other projects I'm showing on our website and find a link to buy them and order them and have them sent to you there. And this is meant as a, an icebreaker and a way to start conversations, um, a way to peer into the minds of Washington staff and see some of the things they're thinking and saying to one another. Next. And they launched a rather popular bumper sticker campaign. Um, just cut off at the bottom is the maintenance is sexy bumper sticker, which I believe was the most popular one. I have one on my laptop next to me. Next. And related to that, uh, they created the maintenance post, which very much in line with Smart Growth America and Transportation for America's desires, was really an attempt to focus on the um, unsung labor of maintaining the roadways in Washington state, rather than encouraging the building of new infrastructure. This is a celebration of maintaining mountain passes and just the standard wear and tear on existing roadways. Um, it's often the case that brand new projects have big celebrations and festivals and performances, but the routine and often very dangerous labor that goes on on a daily basis to keep a state moving is not as celebrated. And this is um, one way of doing that in newspaper format. Next, shown here with the inside, just some of the stories that they were able to capture um, from the one district they covered. And finally, a final report, this book is a bridge, uh, which again, you can order on our website to learn much more information about that program. Um, we're here today to talk about Minnesota. That was just a little bit of a, a snapshot of what happened out in Washington. I'm um, really excited to move to the next slide to hand things over to Marcus, who will tell us about the work that he's been able to complete over the last couple of years. Marcus, please take it away. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everybody. Uh, ben, thank you for that very orderly and professional presentation. I, on the other hand, as I try to find my slides, will be much more, shall we say, organic. Hmm. Um, let me try again. Some constant. Uh... Wow. See my slide presentation. Okay. I have to. 
know it was all ready for you all when it was before I got my tea and now look what happened. Just a second. I, I will stall, Marcus. Um, I've seen a couple of questions in the chat about the availability of this recording. So just let everyone know that yes, we will make this available on our website. Hello to everybody watching this in the future. Um, and anyone who's registered for the webinar will get an email with a link to watch this at any time at your convenience. Perfect. Thanks, there we go. <laughs> oh, well. Hi again, everybody. So let's all be friends. That way, you know, um, I'll feel better if <laughs> this doesn't go as planned. But here, sitting in the corner of my second bedroom, um, speaking into this box, let's let's try this. I wanted to start with um, this quote from our Minnesota poet laureate, <clears throat> Dakota poet Gwen Westerman. It's just a phrase, actually. She says, "To share from the heart." in a world where words can be meaningless when they come only from the head. In the poem, Giveaway Song. So I am Marcus Young. Uh, Yang Mo is my Chinese name. You can use he for any pronouns. I'm zooming from Dakota land, uh, this land of Minnesota of Dakota and Anishinaabe land. I hope this presentation is um, can feel that it's informed by that awareness and hopefully helps enhance that awareness as well. Um, I call myself a behavioral artist, which just means I'm interested in art that is close to our everyday lives. I lead a public movement and liberation practice called Don't You Feel It Too? And you can see me doing that silliness in the middle of uh, University Avenue here in Minneapolis. By way of introducing myself a little bit more, here's a project from my past when I was an artist in residence in the city of St. Paul. You see on this slide uh, various stages of replacing sidewalk in a city and interrupting or uh, transforming that established system. The last uh, photo you see there is just inserting and uh, imprinting a poem in the still semi-wet concrete of the sidewalk creating a system that uh, piggybacks onto an established system in order to create a uh, entity for publishing poetry while it's replacing old sidewalk. So this was the very first poem. It reads a little less war, a little more peace, a little less poor, a little more eats. And here is a map of St. Paul with a lot of blue dots. Each blue dot is a two minute walk radius from one of the poems. Uh, this was uh, six years into the, the uh, project. And you can see 700 blue dots, I believe at the time. And now there are at least twice as many now that we're 14 years into the project. It goes on without me, but I was there for the first uh, eight or nine years. So that's just my background. If I were to uh, name a theme for my reflection of the past two and a half years as artist in residence at Minda, I would call it, uh, at least today, I would call it art within and in relation. And simply, and I'll try to expound on this a little bit more at the end, but um, simply that just means art that is more a practice than an object and art that makes you look at each other, makes us look at each other more than focusing on another thing. And um, I'll try to do this in three projects and try to make some meaning at the end. But until then, I'll, I don't wanna try to make too much meaning other than just hope you enjoy feeling these projects as I describe them to you. So um, a very odd place to start, but uh, the SMTP, the Statewide Multimodal Transport you know, you get so deep into a project that things feel normal. And it's only in these moments of reflection that you realize like, wow, okay, creating an art appendix or attempting to for a 20 year plan is not necessarily normal. So it's great to both uh, enter the fictional world of what's normal uh, in the art world and then to pull back and say, okay, 
um, this isn't how it normally happens. What is the potential benefit of trying to create an art appendix, which is what we did. Um, and we just turned it in on Friday. So if this is gonna feel very fresh and this is very un um, rehearsed type of presentation, but um, we were asked to uh, enter into the SMTP process in some way around public engagement. And we were given the uh, direction to collect stories. So here is just from the current uh, min.web page of what the SMTP is. Uh, this is the 2017 version. Of course, we're now at the 2022 version and I believe it's currently in review. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, I don't know how, how clear you can see it, but there is a you know, chapter one, chapter two, and at the very bottom, it says appendices. And that's what I was like interested in. What is, you know, is there a, a way to create a space for a type of art, um, this art within, this art in relation, uh, this art of in-between, art that hides or piggybacks or makes use of spaces that are um, not usually seen as artistic spaces. So we created um, an appendix. This is the cover. This is the cover illustration by Bayou Bay, the, the illustrator designer. I'll just describe it a little bit. You see um, two Native people consoling each other, one with uh, braided sweet grass in her hands, uh, the other with this sort of symbolic uh, heart space that emanates a river and a highway. And then the backdrop is a blue sky and green fields and, blue, and a sunny day and animals and trees and eagle in the sky. And at the top, it says, turn the highways to rivers. That's the name of this art appendix. And at the bottom, you might be able to make out the Council of Old and New Wisdom. So as I said, we were given the direction or suggestion to collect stories for this plan. And um, it made me ask the very simple question, well, is the plan itself a story? Why isn't it a story if, it's, if it isn't? And so sometimes you just have to question uh, the proposition itself. And so in order to do that, we created a fictional council of old and new wisdom to try to do public engagement in a new way. I'm gonna spend a little time with this plan because it's so new and fresh for me and I wanna share it with you. Um, so just, uh, I appreciate your patience as I try to describe it for myself and in front of you all here. Um, just to zoomed in you know, a little bit more of a close up of this cover that was created by Bayou Bay. And the title, Turn the Highways to Rivers, was something that an elder, uh, an African-American uh, artist in our community, Douglas Ewart, said to me uh, two and a half years ago when I was sitting with him and uh, just beginning this, this, um, this journey of an artist in residence program with MnDOT. I had been chosen, but I had no idea what I was going to do. And, probably like my colleagues in Washington, we were wondering, well, what is this gonna be like, this new sort of frontier of artists in residency, this experiment, this pilot program. And so I turned to Douglas and I said, Douglas, what am I gonna do with my year? At that time, we thought it was a year, uh, this year at MnDOT. And he just looked at me without skipping a beat and said, turn the highways to rivers. And from that moment, I. I didn't know, but I was holding on to that instruction all the way till this, now our, our, my last month here. So it, I didn't intend on making it into a project. I held it in my heart and sometimes even forgot about it, but it kept um, haunting me, shall I say, and, uh, and staying with me and inspiring, inspiring me. So a quote uh, that I use at the very beginning of my introduction to this 48 page art appendix, uh, is this from Joy Harjo, a native poet, uh, and also our US poet laureate. She says, when you find your way to the circle, to the fire kept burning by the keepers of your soul, you will be welcomed. So it's not very visual to, um, to uh, 
share with you pages out of the, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, I can't read because of my own screen. And so I'm gonna try to read to you from another computer, but it's not very visual to uh, read to you from pages of a plan, but I hope the meaning will be evident uh, from the text. And I really wanna read because I want many more voices to be part of this presentation. So, on the, and you might not be able to see this, so uh, please just let go of the need to see something and hopefully my voice will be expressive enough and carry some of the weight and uh, feelings of um, the council members, this council of old and new wisdom. So Juanita Espinosa said, everything that we see around us can be taken care of. Everything that we plant, the food that was here can be replanted. It can come back on its own. I always said, we need to have a welcome center to try and explain to people how we need to treat the land here, how you need to treat all the elements here, how you need to be thankful for the land here. And so anyone that grows up here is going to, in essence, eat the spirit of that land in their food eat the spirit of that thought in how they do things. And it's gonna be over time before they see it, you know. It's not going to happen immediately. But as they see it, I think it starts to resonate. And it always resonates with me how often we forget that the land has the greatest say in how things work around here. I think a little interesting, I don't know if it's an innovation, but an interesting creation of ours for this 48 page appendix is just adding where the SMTP planners themselves resonated with some of the stories and comments by our council members. So below that, Abdullahi Abdullah, one of the three project planners says, as an immigrant, this resonated with me very much. Both the Latinx and East African communities are here in this area and are new and learning alongside the people who have always been here. So another page in the, um, in the appendix is a poem. Uh, I highly recommend this to all of you who do this kind of public engagement and maybe sort of uh, these sessions. Uh, someone like Marie Chante Flowers, who has this enormous gift of listening, and then on the spot, you know, in the moment, writing a poem, uh, reflecting back both what she hears and um, what she's thinking herself. So this poem, Home Safe, and when this 48-page uh, appendix is made available, you'll actually be able to listen to clips live from the um, the sessions. So she says, home safe, take me home, let me travel alongside the familiar, learn how to navigate worlds I've never seen before, nor been told I belong. Keep me safe, I am an asset to this place at this time, and I need to be a bridge for generations. How can I help others get over if I am unstable? Let me stay strong. My infrastructure cracks at the seams and I need not to come undone. Show others how to care for me. The roads are not as kind as I am, but they are mine and I will travel them in peace. So you can imagine at the end of a two hour session, she just drops this on us and uh, you know, sort of profoundly resonates in a way that um, only poetry can. And Bayou um, is, was inspired visually and so created a lot of um, uh, graphic images to support some of the text. And here you see um, three people moving creatively, expressing themselves. This in the backdrop is the, actually the state transportation building, and marigolds around us, and a lotus. You know. So uh, thank you for giving me a little bit of time to go into detail for the 
this plan. I'll just wrap up this plan by reading a couple lines from my um, summary of the plan. I say, uh, there is a lot to digest in this art appendix. Digestion and dreaming are deeply related activities, both only possible when the nervous system is at rest. Digesting transforms the gifts of food from the earth into energy that our bodies can use. Our dreams are a wild spark of life, helping us imagine the possibility of profound transformation in daily life. And the last two lines, rest, digest, dream, breathe, transform. May these pages disrupt and inspire you. The second project I wanted to just tell you about is um, also very strange, but um, just demonstrates the generosity of MnDOT to welcome me into their space and the sort of cleverness and forethought of Jessica O, oh, who will be presenting after me and my contact at uh, MnDOT. I was asked to present at the annual manager's workshop and that might not seem like such a big deal, but it was a huge deal to me. It's an annual two-day uh, convening of about 200 or more managers of, uh, of MnDOT. And in 90 minutes, I was given 90 minutes, um, along with uh, my other co-presenters, to try something new. And while this may not look like art, uh, it's certainly bordered on it, art adjacent, can we say. Um, and hopefully it was something new and refreshing and opens the path to how we do these kinds of, uh, whether they're trainings or um, convenings or gatherings. I called this uh, 90 minute presentation, I dream of wild blank, uh, a nod to our local organization here called Dream of Wild Health. But the blank is there for you to fill in and it's interactive and is collect a collect collectively making of a dream. Um, here is a painting I started by presenting a painting by Métis artist Christy Belcour uh, called The Wisdom of the Universe. And you see in front of you on the slide this vibrant, vital symphony of color and animals and plants in seemingly in beautiful uh, balance and harmony. Uh, but if you read the notes that Christy provides, these are plants that have um, either gone extinct or um, on the edge of going extinct. There's a quote from Christy. The state of the world is in crisis. It is possible for the planet to return to a state of well-being, but it requires a radical change in our thinking. It requires a willingness to be open to the idea that perhaps human beings have got it all wrong. And you know, that line just struck me so hard. Human beings, perhaps human beings have got it all wrong. We need to build our capacity to be able to cozy up to that thought, to that idea, in order to be um, brave to find dramatic, radical change um, in the way we do things. Well, I, I'll try not to go on too much, but you know, here is a, just a glimpse into the session where 130 people answered, you know, after an embodied process, a sharing of stories process, sharing your own transportation stories. Many transportation professionals do their work not having ever had the chance to share their own personal transportation story of why they're um, doing what they're doing or why, how do they connect to the aspirations and the suffering of other people. Um, so after the process, we finally, the culmination was to text or uh, type into your computer um, how you finish this line, I dream of wild. Uh, and I want to bring in some voices. So Jessica, I know this is a little bit Ben, I didn't ask you this ahead of time, but I did ask Jessica and Ebony to help me out just to bring in some voices. Jessica, can you read the top right hand response? Sure, Marcus. I dream of wild land and innovation, green and abundant with people learning and moving with the land, nurturing it and appreciating it instead of just passing over it or damaging it. 
Thank you. It's so nice to hear multiple voices. Ebony, thank you for agreeing ahead of time. Can you read the bottom left response? I dream of wild asset data, really, taking advantage of infinite opportunities that we can't even imagine yet, crowd-based ingenuity, optimizing the dots effectiveness. Thank you. And Ben, if you, if I didn't catch you off guard too much, can you read the bottom middle one if you are able to see it? Sure, happy to do that. Um, I will also chime in. I mentioned this in the chat, Marcus. A couple of people have mentioned that your microphone volume has been going up and down. It's not oh. too noticeable to me, but others have maybe noticed it more. Sorry for interrupting the flow. Um, I'll read the bottom middle one as you just suggested. I dream of wild support from senior leadership, coworkers, and community to implement both popular and not popular solutions that address safety, equity, and the need to maintain or enhance our roadways. Thank you, Ben. So if you could imagine hundreds, uh, at least 130 of these kind of scrolling, um, being able to read and see the dreams um, of your fellow workers um, in a convening um, that is supposed to encourage um, practice of dreaming, that we all need to be in better practice of being in touch with our human, deeply human, empathetic selves. I know I'm short on time. I'm gonna to try to speed things up a little bit. Um, just reading a couple of these that came from staff members and also from community members. I dream of a wild future where I can comfortably walk to anywhere I desire. Walking contributes to my mental and physical health. Living in a future where I can walk to work, to shop, to the daycare, and to fulfill all my daily needs is truly a wild dream. And this one, I dream of the wildness of not feeling separate from my surroundings. I think the word wild comes from the Proto-Indo-European root that means forest. And I think of a forest ecosystem where every living being knows it's in relationship with innumerable other species. My last project I wanna tell you about is um, sort of a hijacking of a conference room at Mindot Central Office. So this is, now called officially changed or as officially as you can if you just change the sign to the door um, the land acknowledgement conference room so this is the room uh before its transformation i think it's okay to say that it's this was is a very beige room uh literally and metaphorically speaking um it's an unbeloved room a lot of people told me they just you know it's just room that's maybe a little bit uninspiring overlooked under cared for and you can tell by the art that was hanging on the walls that um, you can see here a poster from i don't know maybe the 90s like the hallmark kind of kind of uh, aesthetic um, the word goals and the word success so from this kind of look uh, this is going to be an artistic rendering it's in, currently in its final stages of transformation i'd say we're 99 percent done um, but I, for various reasons, especially related to COVID, I can't get to the space very often to take good photos for you. So this is a rendering that we used early on to guide us in the transformation of this land acknowledgement conference room. Here it is from a different angle. The room is airier and different places for sitting, um, plants and art on the walls and a rug and meditation cushions. And, uh, you know, why transform a room? Why give it this grand name, uh, the Land Acknowledgement Conference Room? Well, here I'm trying to create a place and a placeholder to explore new and everyday cultural practices of land acknowledgement. And I want to demonstrate how um, space can be reimagined to encourage creativity, whole self presence and engagement, deepening connection to each other, and humanizing of the work. I won't go into this too much, but there's a wall that uh, uh, promotes and explains different amazing works of art. One that you heard Ben talk about with Mara later in Eucalyptus, and another one in El Paso, uh, you know, that brought back the streetcar. Uh, we worked with the library to include um, items from the collection, the diversity and inclusion collection in the room. So it's uh, much more sort of closer to everyday work when the workforce can go back to offices. And um, there was a wall with a lot of um, quotes and um, uh, voices of staff 
So in the center, I just want to focus just one brief moment on um, some of the uh, text from former commissioner Charles, Charles Zelly, uh, which is an apology. And I think it's important to that this apology uh, is present, uh, not forgotten. So just kind of a constant reminder in a conference room. And the bottom part says, no question, disturbing the sacred burial sites was an incredibly horrific event. We do take responsibility. We're just beginning to understand the pain and the anger that comes from a disruption that we could have avoided. And then a fellow MnDOT staff person just uh, in the quote above said, we spend a lot of our resources being predictable. MnDOT sees it as a technical problem to deal with spiritual land. We are bound by the technical processes. We build roads. We know numbers and facts. We don't know what to do with emotions. MnDOT is not the only agency with this problem. I wonder if that's what art fits in. Um, to wrap up, I just want to say, remind myself and remind us that you know this is the this theme that I was working with is art within and in relation. So the art that I was able to help create this last two and a half years may not look like the typical art that we think of when we think of uh, public art or uh, what artists make in resonance with uh, agencies like Mint. But I want to point out that this is art making that starts by looking at what we have and who we are, not thinking of art as um, filling empty spaces, empty in quotes, or uh, places to change. It's art that invites participation, overviewing, uh, acknowledges the artist and everyone, and prioritizes how we relate, not how we separate. Um, and in my mind, it's art of how as opposed to art of what. So it's art of processes, art of behaviors, art of systems, how we gather. It's the softer and the more in between. So I want to conclude by just reading you a little bit from my introduction to this um, art appendix called Turn the Highways to Rivers. Um, Telling stories is a practice to keep ourselves human. Each statewide multimodal transportation plan writes 20 years of the story of transportation and freedom of movement. More than a set of guidelines or rules, a plan can be a human story full of joy and tears, apologies and dreams, love and belonging. Now more than ever, we need story plans to be fearlessly honest, deeply moving, unwaveringly brave. I just have two more slides for you. Uh, from, again, from the introduction, we live in fiction. Dreaming, planning, and belonging are mostly fiction. Fiction keeps us moving forward, and working fiction into further reality is necessary creation. We urgently need new creation, new options, new ways of being. May this project serve as a reference for future truth and storytelling. May MnDOT experience more body, culture, and land-based ways of knowing to cultivate change at a root level, helping MnDOT live by its other name, the Department for the Freedom of Movement. May we turn the highways to everlasting and ever-changing rivers. May we accelerate on the path to living just and beautiful lives. And with that, I just take my bow and say thank you. Thank you for the extra time. And Jessica, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Marcus, for, for sharing those pieces and uh, just for working with us these last two and a half years. It's been such an amazing and humbling <clears throat> journey as we've embarked. I think we started off you know, fairly uncertain around where we would go and, and what we would do. And, and Marcus has had to confront doing this incredible work in an agency, you know, trying to respond and, and really be part of this current moment of being, being in the middle of a pandemic. So we're just grateful for all that you've contributed. You know, this is just such a small smattering of the projects that you've done in the last two and a half years. So there's, there's many, many others, but you've always encouraged us to you know, I think that if anything, the silver lining of the pandemic has allowed for you to interact with more people in different ways uh, and helping us imagine a different future for, you know, for 
transportation within the state of Minnesota. So I extend to you gratitude for that. Okay, so um, you know, my goal for the next few slides is to just quickly share a few reflections uh, on this innovative and different experience that we've undertaken. So you'll see a, a visual here that's a, a sampling of the book covers from our diversity inclusion collection from the land, land acknowledgement confluence room that Marcus uh, commandeered and is really going uh, or has, you know, helped us think about how we gather differently, how we really bring our whole selves and our creative selves to, to the work of delivering the transportation system. So things that really resonated through this process have been, you know, sort of a focus on the humanness in transportation. Uh, our commissioners have always, uh, the last, our last few commissioners have very much encouraged uh, our workforce to bring their whole selves to work and bring sort of a more wholehearted approach to the work. And Marcus has really helped embody that and helped us make some of those shifts. And that's been a very positive experience. Generally, you know, in such a large bureaucracy, for those of you that are joining us from other DOTs, as you know, you know, certainly our work can be siloed with different modes and different parts of the agency and different districts and different urban versus rural needs. And the work that he did really brought together and allowed for us to be interdisciplinary uh, more often than not, which really resonated. And I think, you know, getting diverse groups of people together to solve complex problems or work on complex issues or opportunities is really a precious thing in a very large agency such as a, a DOT. His work overall showed very much a pent up demand for different skill sets. So we have a, a big long list of projects that Marcus was invited to participate in, but didn't have capacity to do. So you know, it, which the projects range from, you know, longer term planning to projects in the short term, projects in the long term, you know, in, internal engagement opportunities, a huge range, but Marcus's skills were solidly in demand far more than he had capacity to, to, to work on. Uh, and generally, I believe that, you know, engaging artists can help us talk about the difficult things, uh, you know, the sensitive issues around divided and communities that have been harmed by transportation infrastructure. Uh, Marcus has demonstrated such a sensitivity to framing and asking bold questions that really has been very, very helpful for uh, doing the work. And we think that there's a gazillion opportunities to engage and include an artist in integrating these creative approaches and interventions from you know, making your equity vision, you know, real in different ways to planning and public engagement and certainly uh, working and supporting our workforce who does the hard work every day. So uh, a kudos and a thank you to everyone, especially all my MnDOT colleagues who are joining us today, who've been part of this journey uh, with Marcus during these last few years. And I have to say, had, had you know, the pandemic not have happened and how things were, you know, structured together, you know, we wouldn't have had the depth of interactions that we have. Uh, so one of my pieces of advice, if you're considering engaging artists and residents, that really multi-year residencies will, will allow for deeper impact and engagement, as opposed to just, you know, a super quick um, one and done. The opportunity to go deeper is far more meaningful. Next slide. So just a few just big picture challenges that we kind of came across that Marcus was invited to participate in projects that were in that you know, four to six year cycle out, which, you know, in a, in a, in a need and a desire to have an immediate impact in the work that we do, sometimes those long transportation planning cycles can be a challenge with uh, implementing creative projects, but certainly I think there's ways to make an impact from different angles. You know, I think uh, artists and residents really needs a home base and needs friendly faces to help them navigate our large bureaucracy. Generally, I think we still, even to this day, there was the impression that an artist, you know, that the only kind of artists are visual artists. And uh, that really there, the role of an artist would only be for art and aesthetic purposes, which is really missing the whole point of utilizing a different creative lens to, to solve problems and to help support the work. And so Marcus is a behavioral artist. And he really challenged us um, in far more complex ways than something as simple as art and aesthetics. 
uh, you know, truly, if you have the capacity to go deeper to engage an art, uh, artist in more than, you know, very simple projects, I think we could have used a full time artist or several full time artists to really engage in this work. Um, you know, we had the goal with the with the residency of implementing a new policy or a process or a project and through all of Marcus's various um, activities, he really touched upon all of those. So I encourage for DOTs who are considering undertaking uh, embedding an artist to think about all the different ways that they could impact uh, the work that you do every day. And I want to give a kudos and a shout out to Smart Growth because MnDOT is not an expert in engaging artists, hiring artists, any of these elements. And Smart Growth really, really helped us frame and supported our success by thinking through issues differently and really brought a different voice and skill set into navigating this kind of groundbreaking work that at time, was, was kind of hard. There were some hard moments. You know, MnDOT has a very normal consultant kind of deliverable orientation, uh, as I think we all do uh, in utilizing taxpayer dollars to deliver the transportation system. But we, we needed to take a step back and, and look at it a little bit more deeply around what are the opportunities uh, from within to, to really make impacts culturally. Next slide. So this next slide shows um, a photo of the quotes that Marcus showed before that are part of the land acknowledgement confluence room. And um, just generally, though, even though our focus was not on aesthetics and public art, there is, I think there is an opportunity for those that really want to work with communities to better improve the experience um, and the impacts of living next to transportation infrastructure. But most importantly, and some of the really important work that I think Marcus did was helping really facilitate critical conversations and help us um, realize uh, uh, how our, our, our equity vision could be realized in different corners of the agency. So I, I you know, just grateful for all that he did uh, on that, that front. I think really I would encourage people to not just um, think of artists. There's lots of different ways that different types of artists can contribute. And one of the things I underestimated or didn't really understand when Marcus was joining us is sort of, which makes sense, is how his products and works of art with us would fit within his larger body of work as an artist through his full career. And so understanding and connecting those dots and understanding the artist's body of work before they join you, I think is important to understanding their interests uh, and what they can contribute to your, your agency. The you know, artists that have worked with communities, worked with, um, you know, underserved people. I think all of those are, are um, folks who have the skills to really do that collaborative work really are essential in working with a DOT with so much bureaucratic uh, red tape and just, um, you know, lots of processes and systems and approvals. So uh, overall, I think there's a huge opportunity to consider many projects with an artist as opposed to one large creative project. Certainly Marcus had both during his time with us, but as you're thinking about you know, creating an artist in residence program, the flexibility to focus on either many small projects or one large creative project, I think is something that you would want to leave a bit open to determine your artist's interests and what where the where the discovery process sort of sort of leads you. So during when Marcus joined us, um, we didn't have a specific area of focus for his work. He was sort of to get to know our agency listen, listen very deeply into what are the conversations and what are the needs uh, and what are the opportunities that are being presented and his creative projects sort of uh, grew from, from those seeds. Uh, different artists and residence programs have also experimented with a little bit more of a focused approach, uh, which can include, you know, honing in really where you want the the artistic projects to focus on. So I think that there's pros and cons of both approach, both um, a more free form um, experience for both the agency and for the artists, but also potentially, you know, if you have an area, we have heard of artists and residents working on towards zero deaths or some other really critical transportation issues. I think there's also uh, a lot of opportunity to focus their work in specific areas. Next slide. So just a couple other, you know, points of advice for those considering these programs, you know, consider how you're going to leverage the full resources of, a, of your DOT. The deeper embedded that the artist is, the more that they can access the full resources to support their creative projects. That stretches dollars further and really avails the full resources. So whether that's 
videographers, photographers, print shops, sign shops, you name it. We have a lot of resources that can be activated to support the projects of the, of the artist. So I encourage uh, folks to really think creatively around how those resources can be, can be leveraged. I also think that, you know, there's so much curiosity around an artist and a transportation agency that I encourage DOTs to bring everybody along and to do those larger webinars, to share the artist's vision, to you know, kind of include people as you move through the journey uh, to summarize the creative process and projects. I think people are really interested in uh, you know, how it goes and, and to really find opportunities to, to be involved. So we were very strategic around engaging our senior leaders in that process and really looking for opportunities to connect our, our strategic vision with these activities and, and the importance of those as we make cultural shifts uh, in, our, in our agency. So I would encourage you to connect those leaders. I would encourage you to try to find friendly faces uh, that can be collaborators as the artist moves through their projects. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Mindad is a very, very large agency with more than 5,000 employees. So navigating, getting to know the work of a DOT can be quite, uh, I think, overwhelming. So I hope you will build a, a friendly team and friendly collaborators. Generally, uh, you know, both WASH, I've heard uh, the secretary, uh, Roger Millar, and our commissioner, uh, reflect on that there's just a unique magic of supporting our workforce through these programs. And so our employees being our most precious resource, uh, I think that there's extensive opportunities to, to support our employee resource group and our, our employees and other elements in, in doing the hard work that we do every day. Uh, so overall, you know, Marcus's impact on us was, was, was significant. And I think that his the projects and the seeds that he's um, buried will bear fruit long after he has, has finished his, his time with us. Next slide. Here's a quick quote from one of Marcus's collaborators with our, our Office of Equity and Diversity. Um, having Marcus as an artist in residence gave people this very, in this very linear engineering culture, permission to imagine and explore different possibilities without judgment. Wild imaginings and new connections to the land and the people of Minnesota will continue to resonate with this agency for many years to come. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a quote from another collaborator of Marcus's with the statewide multimodal transportation plan from the policy planning uh, director in the Office of Transportation System Management. The, the, the collaborative creative process allowed us to explore options and alternatives that we may not have otherwise explored. Working with artists and community members in a pandemic required flexibility to adapt to each new challenge. Yet the process showed us the beauty of exploring unknown places together. There's a lot of opportunity in conversations where we resolve to follow where the wisdom leads without a prescriptive agenda. We need to champion these types of creative processes in our work. Next slide. And I think we're now to this. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to quickly mention that um, we're excited for our third year of our pilot. Um, you know, we can share this when we share out the deck with everyone else. But our focus of our third year is going to be on addressing the you know pressing issues of our time and in, in, in climate action and so our artists will be focused on you know things like you know vmt reduction and low carbon transportation futures and you know better access for bike and pet and transit and other ways of you know collaborating with communities to support our our climate action vision so we're very excited to undertake uh, this next year and with that i will pass it back to ben to open up the questions and answers thank you so much for joining us and for, you know, this opportunity to collaborate in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Marcus. Um, as everyone's probably noticed, we are, what, three, four minutes till the top of the hour. This is pretty typical, and we have such a complex and interesting project to describe, so I'm not at all surprised by that. It's um, not something we haven't dealt with before. If you have a question on your mind, I see a few of you have put them into the Q&A uh, tab. You can still put some questions in there and we'll answer them and put them up on our blog post in written form for you all to take a look at after the webinar is over. 
Um, in the couple minutes we have left, um, I'll mention at least one thing and then I'll ask a question to get us started in a very short conversation. And that one thing is that um, we have, of course, this program running at MnDOT about to enter its third year. Similar program has been running at WashDOT. Um, I've been in touch with a number of other DOTs. I'm hoping a year from now when we're wrapping up the third year at MnDOT, we'll have at least two, three other DOTs talking about the great work they've done. If you're representing a DOT on this webinar today or you're listening to this in the future, get in touch. Love to find out what you all are up to, um, be part of the work that you all hope to launch in the artist and residence space. Um, let's see. We only have time for, for one question. Um, how about this is a, a really simple question to throw out with a 90 seconds to answer, Marcus. Um, I had a question about uh, how the pandemic. And of course, being in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, the murder of George Floyd had an impact on the work that you were completing, both at the end of your first year and then um, during the pandemic entirely during your second year. Wow. Um, well, I'll take them separately. Like the pandemic, of course, you know, in no other time in recent history do we need to be. Um, more in tune with ourselves and um, be very forgiving and how, you know, and very aware and sensitive of how we relate to one another. Um, so uh, I felt at least a certain call or a certain opportunity to lean into that. Um, as Jessica said, you know, the invitation from the commissioner to bring your whole selves. Well, you know, how do we do that in the time of pandemic? And uh, very short answers here, but in the time uh, of the murder and the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, you know, I, I think of a Jenny Holzer quote. I looked, I looked up a Jenny Holzer quote this morning, and this is on a bench at the Walker Arts Center. And the quote is, there is a period when it is clear that you have gone wrong, but you continue. Sometimes there is a luxurious amount of time before anything bad happens. I, I quote that just because it's, you know, it's been going wrong for a long time. And, um, and so this is um, systemic and, and a, a deep, you know, deep systemic issue. And we just have to keep at it on a daily basis. This is not a one time thing. And um, it's not a great answer, but a short answer perhaps. Thanks so much for that. Do either of you have any questions you'd like to ask, Marcus or Jessica? In the one minute we have left. Oh, I'll just ask a Ben, what is um, you know, what's 10 years down the road like? What does this look like? Or 20 years? Pick a pick a pick a number. I'll go with 10. 20 seems rather far on the horizon. I think um something the three of us have talked about, and Marcus, I've definitely heard this from you that. You know, it's great to have an artist in residence at a DOT, as Jessica said, a 5,000 person bureaucracy. Um, as we were just hearing, there's so many different ideas from your fellow colleagues at, at Mindon as to how an artist could help them with their work. But I think having a DOT take on more than one artist, have this not just be a idiosyncratic position that comes about every once in a while because of hopefully public funding and sometimes grant funding, but rather an integrated role within a number of different teams showing there's a role to play within maintenance, within different divisions, et cetera, et cetera, is where I'd like to see this go, both the MnDOT and a number of other DOTs out there. Um, as a representative of the national organization, I, of course, am interested in other places around the country picking up this work, lots of very different kinds of places um, as well, doing this too, and that's starting to happen. Um, but I, I think much like, um, the way we talk about issues of sustainability and equity, the more integrated this is, and the less we all have to think about adding it in after the fact. Um, it's where I'd like to see this go so that as people are putting together teams, of course, there would be a Marcus or a counterpart on the team rather than thinking about it after a project's already been formed. Jessica, anything you want to quickly add? No, I would concur with all those hopes and dreams. Excellent. Well, sorry again, we didn't have more time to get to all the questions. We will do our best to write them up and add them to the blog in the next week or so and email everybody who registered for this webinar. Thank you again to Minda, to Jessica, to Marcus, to Ebony for running um, everything behind the scenes for us. 
and everyone take care and cheers. Yes, thank you, everybody. Take good care to your health. <laughs>